<laughs> so, so I'm going to talk to you about quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics and biology normally are not two, they're both forms of science. Uh, they're not normally mentioned in the same breath. So we have this beautiful background here of a biological environment in uh, Yellowstone. Now, where is the quantum mechanics there, you might think? Well, so there's actually a lot of current interest in exploring possible instances of qu uh, true quantum behavior in biological systems, ranging from plants and bacteria, photosynthesis, which I'll spend most of the time talking about. This is sort of drifts. Uh, <laughs> to birds, I'll tell you a little bit about birds. Uh, this is kind of like an ant. <laughs> um, to maybe I can do it with this. No. Nope. Oh, here we go. Yes, is it there? Right. Okay. Birds. Birds. How birds navigate north and south uh, around the globe. To uh, smell. Animal sense of smell. I won't have time to say anything much about this, but if you ask me afterwards, I can say a few words. And ion channels. And in the brain, there's been lots of activity discussion over many years about that. So the resurgence in this, is, is this really is a resurgence of an interest that started a very long time ago. In fact, Bohr, when he'd cleaned up quantum physics, turned his attention to biology, and they thought that quantum mechanics should apply to biology, and spent basically from 1929 onwards thinking about this. But the first person who really actually made a serious contribution here was a student of Bohr's, Max Delbruck, who was really the first quantum biologist, and he was successful because he worked together with biologists. Always useful to actually have an interdisciplinary team to deal with an interdisciplinary subject. So he got together with a geneticist and a photobiologist, which is now what you nowadays you would call a physical chemist, uh, and they pro probed what at that time was called genetic structure and the mutations and stability of that genetic structure with X-rays. And this was the first true quantum probe of biological structures and function. So this basically put on center stage the need to understand the detailed molecular structure of functional biological systems. And so I tend to classify the whole field into uh, an, an AL and a BL. Uh, the BL, like BC, is the first era, and the BL means before the laser. And this is the area in which people recognize that biological systems are made up of atoms and molecules. Atoms and molecules, we understood from the beginning of the 20th century, were quantum mechanical in nature. There were quantum energy, quantized energy levels and energy barriers. And the stability of uh, biological matter could be understood in terms of sort of the basic quantum elements of matter. And that's all nicely summarized in Schrodinger's book in 1943. But the second era, so if we like, the culmination of that would come in the 50s with the structure of DNA, the molecular structure of DNA. The second era, however, starting in the 1960s with the laser, so I call that after the laser, is an era where we're focusing not on structure and stability, but we're focused on quantum dynamical uh, effects. And the, we're, we're this interest is being fueled by new generations of dynamical probes coming from nanoscience and nanotechnology, and a lot of innovation via the new quantum science and technology, which is linked to things like quantum information, quantum computing, and so on. So this is a summary of the kind of things that are going on today that uh, I would classify as pro developing new probes of uh, structure and dynamics of biological systems. On the top is just one example, where a group at Harvard has a surface which they put these tiny little silicon nano rods on top, and then they just deposit living cells on top of this, and they use the nano rods as a, as a tool to access uh, the cells, and they can deliver biochemical uh, or biomolecular um, um, probes into the molecule. They can look at the cellular response with electrical monitoring and so on. The other form is a form which is, lies behind the kind of work that I'm talk, uh, going to tell you about in photosynthesis, is a very, uh, are very sophisticated forms of spectroscopy where we shine light on our samples. And in this case, we might shine three different rays of light on something very, all very carefully timed, 
all with specific spatial directions and phase matching and so on. And that enables us to learn something about the dynamics of electronic energy in photosynthesis. So if we were looking at the big picture, why are we studying this kind of thing? Well, we could say that we're driven by the tools, which are the tools of quantum science and technology, which enable us to come down and down and down in the length scale. So going from the whole brain, for instance, down to you know, single neurons, and then further down through the ion channels and individual molecules and atoms. So down with these tools, we can go to areas where we know, when we're down to individual atoms and molecules, that quantum effects should be important. The real challenge is going up again on the other side, which is the side where we schematically here represented function. So we know that there's some, somewhere here on this two-dimensional plot, time scale and length scale, there is a region where everything is quantum. Coming out here, normally we can just take the classical description. But what does this tell, if we come out here from the classical up to our larger and larger length scales, and larger time scales, what do we learn about having probed this quantum region here? What do we learn that's essential for the biological function? And this is, I think, a true unsolved problem for any given instance of quantum biology that I can show to you. It's an open and very challenging and very exciting question, namely whether the quantum behavior of the molecular and atomic dynamics can be relevant for biological so, and this is not an isolated problem in biology, it's very much more unusual in biology than in physics. There's, a also, there's often a discussion about the quantum classical border. When do things behave quantumly? When do they behave classically? <laughs> Typically, we think about the quantum world as being the microscopic world, electrons and atoms, and classical behavior would be the behavior of a, of a pulp like this, a uh, macroscopic object. And in, in, in physics, we have the same sort of incongruous situations where often people are looking now at macroscopic objects, like this world here. <coughs> we go into some place here, and there, is there a sharp boundary between uh, a classical landscape and a quantum landscape, which is just schematically indicated here by these paths by bifurcating the uh, clouds, <laughs> dividing into two, and if you know about Schrodinger's cat, it's having a nap and uh, an eternal nap down here <laughs> at the same time, uh, so on. All right, so that's just a cartoon. But that's to tell you that this whole, so this is why this quantum biology is of great interest to physicists as well, because they are definitely what we call open quantum systems and not isolated biological systems so All right, so I'm gonna say a few, um, probably uh, most of the time I'll spend actually summarizing the effects that have been observed and our analysis of this in photosynthesis. Uh, and then I'll say a little bit about the birds and I think that will probably be all, have, all I'll have time for. So in photosynthesis, so on the right there is a little cartoon of what photosynthesis does. A green leaf would absorb light from the sun and this uh, light is converted into electronic energy by these objects called light harvesting complexes, and that's these, uh, this is shown here for purple bacterium, these beautiful little uh, circular structures. And, and the electronic energy is then uh, used to make to drive chemical reactions which build up the chemical storage, or the chemical storage of energy, which we then use, or the plants uh, use, uh, to, to survive. So this light harvesting is an amazing, it's actually a truly amazing um, process. The energy travels over about 30 nanometers in one nanosecond, it's very fast. And I've lost my, yeah, here it is. And it has near perfect efficiency, meaning that for every single photon or every single packet of light that comes in, one pair of Electron, one electron eventually is uh, created and can undergo a chemical reaction. So there's a quantization condition here, and it's, a, it's an efficiency uh, which is very, very unusual in a biological system. I mean, these, these things are really have 95, 98% efficiency of conversion of a photon into an electron. It's actually an electron hole pair. 
Secondly, the experiments reveal a kind of wave-like uh, transport of the energy. And it's this wave-like transport which has got a lot of attention in recent years. And you can think of it just in a non-scientific way of saying that the excitation energy is spread out over a rough energy landscape. And if you have a wave, it's like having a big football which goes over a rough scape, landscape much easier than a golf ball, which will get stuck in these traps between these sites here. And these are the things that we've found out about this. It, this coherence does contribute about 10% to efficiency. The natural systems are amazingly optimal, as far as we can see, with respect to all possible parameters in the system. There's no artificial system that gets anywhere close to competing with this high efficiency of basically just harvesting the, the photons. Another interesting thing, which we don't fully understand why it's there, or whether to, to what extent it's general, is that this coherence does enable you to go uphill, so that's actually related to the roughness of these surfaces here, and also does enable long-range energy transport. So, um, so, let's see, so a few more interests. So these are, this is again just a summary. So here are the light reactions. So this part here where the quantum behavior has been evidenced is just up here where the light energy is absorbed and converted into these electrons, electron hole pairs, which then undergo all these light reactions and so forth chemistry. And the process of this um, harvesting is also a funnel because one has different pigments going down and they to the, the reaction center, the bottom of the funnel where the charge separation occurs. And these uh, high efficiencies are displayed by systems as diverse as green plants, bacteria living in shallow pools, and also bacteria living uh, thousands of meters. This is actually one is two kilometers below the surface of the ocean. And of course there's no sunlight here, but there are hot vents and they obtain radiation, basically thermal radiation, from the um, coming up from the interior of the Earth and use it in the same way. So here's another remarkable thing about the uh, green plants, and it really is this is really mind-boggling. Photosystem two, which is the light harvesting apparatus in a green plant, which is in about 50% of the green matter on Earth. This is uh, so the, the part that does the light that, that absorbs the light. Uh, from the sun uh, are chlorophyll molecules which make the plants green because they absorb in other regions of the spectrum. And if you calculate how much green, how much chlorophyll there is in a green tree, and this is something which one of my colleagues, graduate students, calculated from this beautiful picture by Picasso, you find out that in a typical large tree, there's only 500 milligrams of primary chlorophyll chlorophylls that are responsible for making these electrons, absorbing sunlight and making the electron hole pairs. So all this machinery that the plant has to enable it to um, harvest the sun's energy is done by a very, very small amount of material. So these are remarkable nanomachines, really, truly remarkable. So the, qu the big question was whether the, when the light is absorbed, whether the light would the, the light would be converted into an excitation of this chlorophyll molecules represented here just by this green circle. And it used to be believed that this excitation would then just hop from one chlorophyll to another through the system until they get to the region where the, the excitation can be converted into an electron hole pair and then a chemi chemical reaction would occur. So this is a process which has this very high efficiency known as a quantum yield. But now it's thought that this excitation doesn't really hop, it moves more like a wave. And let me show you what is really meant by this. So saying it moves like a wave is basically saying that there's coherence. And here's a very classical, very old fashioned example of uh, demonstrating what coherence is. There are these five gentlemen here on a pentacycle. And if they all pedal together in step, they will move forward. They will be moving, <coughs> they will be pedaling uh, coherently and they'll actually have then constructive interference and go forward. However, if they, so then they would be like this wave down here. If, however, they're like this, they're all pedaling incoherently and one has its foot up and the other one has a foot down, that's incoherent and they will not move forward, they will very rapidly fall off. <laughs> so, 
So a coherent addition of waves at different frequencies, so we'll give them beats, these gentlemen will fall off. And what we do in the uh, lab is we do this multidimensional spectroscopy where we put in here three, one, two, three pulses of light, and we vary the central time between the second and the third, we create a spectrum, and the spectrum, the way in which the spectrum changes with the, the time here, tells us what happens to the excitation. And this is a movie which I think will probably take a minute, but it will show you, it's a minute which represents something like 800 femtoseconds, that's 800 times 10 to the minus 15 seconds. And this illustrates very nicely what these quantum beats are. So this is one of those spectra shown now in three dimensions, like a mountain, there's a peak and a coal, and so on. And now if we change that time between the second and the third peak, the form of this spectrum changes, and you see the peak starts to oscillate, and there are peaks coming out here on the side of the mountain, which are also going up and down and oscillating. Okay. And these are the, these are the evidence for so-called quantum beating of the electronic excitation in this biological light harvesting system. So I'll stop that. Uh, they're also entangled. And this is one of these uh, really non, completely non-intuitive features that uh, Schrodinger gave a special name to, the entanglement, the character, he called this the, the characteristic of quantum mechanics. And what is it, the entanglement? It means that there are non-local correlations between electronic states on one molecule and on another molecule. And as a way to visualize this, if you're not at all scientifically inclined and don't, can't start anything with equations, is if you look at this so-called ambiguous cube at the top, the pair of ambiguous cubes, depending how you look at them, you'll perceive one of them as being in the forward direction or in the backward direction oriented in the backward direction. And whichever one you first lock onto, you'll immediately perceive the other one as having the same orientation. <laughs> so your mind, in a sense, is doing some kind of measurement of the, uh, the ambiguous form of these two wire mesh cubes. You're projecting that, that ambiguous form onto this possible answer or this possible answer. And entanglement means that you would be doing this with two cubes that would be separated regardless how far apart, any possible distance apart. They could be, one of them could be on the moon, one of them could be on the earth. Quantum mechanics tells us that however far apart they are, if they are prepared in this ambiguous state, a measurement on one will always cause the other one to have the same result. So this is something very, very non-intuitive. But it seems to be evident in photosynthesis. So, uh, those are things that we're now doing, or the community is now doing, with understanding this understanding that we've gained from uh, the quantum role. It's actually only a quantum role in a very small part of photosynthesis, but it might enable us to design artificial devices which, in the absence of competing biological constraints, would be very effective for conversion for solar energy. And now let me say a few words before I close about the magnetoreception. So magnetoreception refers to the ability of birds to fly thousands of miles across the Earth's surface. And they do so by detecting the inclination of the Earth's magnetic field. So the inclination changes, it's perpendicular to the Earth's surface at the uh, north and south poles, and then it sort of varies very slowly and it's basically almost tangential to the surface at the equator. And so here is a bird which we, uh, we know birds can measure this. The question is whether they measure this using what the physicists, uh, like me, quantum physicists basic equation, that's the Schrodinger equation. So whether they're singing a different song than we normally think. And just as a reminder, birds aren't the only creatures that can do, that can detect magnetic fields. Uh, the, actually, the American cockroach has also been shown to <laughs> detect magnetic fields. So it's believed that this, so here's a hypothesis which um, uses quantum mechanics, whereby the uh, ab absorption of photons by the bird's eye is then activates a molecule called cryptochrome in the back of the uh, rods, uh, cells of the eye. And inside that cryptochrome, there is a system here which will separate uh, again, there's an electronically excited molecule which then converts to a separated electron hole pair. And in this case, it actually makes two different electrons located on different molecules. And
And the dynamics of this, uh, the correlated dynamics of the elect radical pair electrons on different molecules is uh, one possible mechanism for getting the sensitivity to the magnetic field of the birds. So this is also, well, that's the details there, I won't show you that, but this is also an example of this entanglement because we have here two electrons which are located on different molecules uh, and are undergoing some kind of coherent quantum dynamics. Um, so this, this is a, only a hypothesis. There's no real proof because in this case it's very hard to make experiments. We certainly don't have any experiments on live birds. Uh, we have behavioral experiments on birds where we can show that they are um, sensitive to magnetic fields, but there are no biological uh, probes of the live birds. There's, there's some, there are probes of cryptochrome that's been shown to be present in the birds' uh, eyes, um, and the, the, the details of the mechanism certainly haven't been pulled out. So let me, um, we're out of time, let me just have to take those two examples. Uh, let me maybe just show you this one beautiful creature, which is something which is a photosynthetic organism. It actually eats its food and then doesn't uh, eats it chloroplast from algae, and then it doesn't have to eat again because it uses the chloroplast in the algae to do photosynthesis. Mm. So that may be something for us to aspire to. <laughs> and it also is something which makes us feel very humble, certainly as physicists. There's a quote from Albert Einstein. We really feel that Physics is very primitive when you actually look at a living object. And so, if you feel humbled, then just behave like a child. <laughs> <laughs>
amplitudes or some imaginary quantity, some very complex quantity. So, but that's what we mean, that we have a superposition of this configuration with that configuration. And that's a superposition of the wave functions, and that's what we mean by entangled. But how does your, I mean, the Copenhagen interpretation apparently yes. is, if you observe it, you determine it. Yes. And that really bugs me. I don't like that. So, okay, <laughs> well, another, one way to think about these systems in biology is that the biological system acts as a measuring device. And so we actually have a theory of photosynthesis where we say that the reaction center is actually measuring the excitation that comes through. And once, it, once the excitation gets to the reaction center, then it makes a measurement and it does, in, your, in the elementary Copenhagen sense, collapse the wave function and the electron is only here and not there. Exactly. We'll have to Sorry. We can talk more about it. Cut it off, but you can speak after. Yes. Thank you very much.